Depression, hosted by Tom Burke in front of us. Minneapolis and Michigan. Michigan. By way of Chicago. By way of Chicago. Uh, I apologize. And uh, he he just went to Rochester and also Albany where he spoke. Uh, he was in the wave of FBI raids. Uh, he's from the Freedom Socialist Party. And um, I, we here at uh, Burning Books think that FBI repression and any repression by the government on uh, our social movements is uh, something that has to be stopped immediately. And a big issue that we have to deal with because if we're the 99% and there's only 1% that can control all of us 99% through government repression, that's something that we need to overcome. And um, so Tom has a lot of experience and he's part of a committee to stop FBI repression and they work with all sorts of different people, which I'll let him go into. And we focus on political prisoners here and that's FBI repression also. And um, so by the, at, at the end of the, during the discussion, we'll pass around a thing for people to sign in. We have a bathroom here, two exits, and then that's, that's, that's that. And thanks for coming. And, yeah, uh, thank you. All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right. So uh, I'm really happy to be here and thankful that Nate wrote and asked, invited me to come. Um, uh, it also sp spurred the organizing of events in other cities, so we made a little tour out of this, and uh, it's been great. You know, it's, it's uh, I didn't know him and I didn't know the people in the other cities and it's all been wonderful. I have to tell you, we have a good movement where people take care of each other and I appreciate that. So my name is Tom Burke. I'm a longtime uh, Chicago kid and I've lived in Michigan for a couple of years now in Grand Rapids and uh, it's a very nice city if you ever get out that way. Um, a little background about myself is uh, I was a trade unionist for 14 years, a school custodian outside of uh, Chicago in a town called Oak Park. I was active in the union as a steward and then on the executive board of a SEIU local with 23,000 members, big, big local. I've been doing international solidarity activism uh, since I went to college and um, I spent a year abroad in England, Manchester, and it happened to be during the big miner strike that happened there. And that had a big impact on me. I come from a working class family, uh, Irish immigrant family, and that strike really uh, moved me to say that we need to have a better world, you know? So um, when I came back to the U of I in Urbana, um, I joined the anti-apartheid movement. And that's a movement that has inspired a whole generation of people uh, right around my age, you know. And we had great success in bringing apartheid to its knees, along with supporting the African National Congress and Nelson Mandela in particular. And I bring that up because our president was also part of that movement. Barack Obama says he's very inspired by that movement. And he actually wrote the foreword to Nelson Mandela's latest book, right? Um, I also want to point out that Nelson Mandela wasn't taken off the US terrorism list until Condoleezza Rice did it in 2007. Okay? To you know, kind of frame some of the craziness that occurs in our society yeah. and with our government. Yeah, Jerry Adams was supposed to speak here at the Irish Center. Uh huh. But he was on a terrorist list. So Higgins, right, signed the Patriot Act, right, our councilman, congressman, whatever. And uh, Jerry Adams couldn't come. Wow. Well, I saw Jerry in Chicago and shook his hand. Yeah. So we, we, we did our work there, too. Um, so that, that leads me to just say that, you know, I've been involved in Central America solidarity work. And, you know, we used to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for the FMLN in El Salvador and to help the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. We also did solidarity work with Ireland, is what I usually talk about. And uh, we did a lot of this work very much in the open, and we had lots of popular support. And it made a difference to the liberation movements in those countries at, at key times. And mostly, we've been on the winning side of history, I have to say, in our work. And, 
I'm proud of that as a movement, you know. In 1999, I began to do solidarity work with Colombian groups in Latin America. And um, we were the folks that organized the Coca-Cola boycott. We were the ones that came up with the idea, actually, a small committee of us in Chicago. Like a lot of small committees, we spent a few years not getting very far. We weren't very successful at what we did, to be honest, you know? So after three years, we said, we got to do something that kind of captures the imagination and makes Columbia a discussion people have at their dinner tables, you know? And then we saw articles from Columbia saying that Coca-Cola trade unionists were being murdered by paramilitary death squads, you know? Death squads connected to the government and funded by corporations from the U.S., you know? Now, Chiquita is responsible for over 4,000 deaths, right? Chiquita Banana out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Drum and Cole is responsible for the deaths of many trade unionists and the court case that was happening in um, the state of uh, Alabama where they're headquartered, the judge wouldn't allow uh, a former police sergeant to testify. This police sergeant set, was willing to testify that he was in meetings where the Drummond Corporation officials paid the death squad leaders. But the judge ruled that he wasn't allowed to testify. You know, so American justice is not justice at all. It's very much being narrowed more and more about what you can present. So those are just some examples. When U.S. oil companies pump oil through pipelines in Colombia, they're patrolled by U.S. military. That's where your tax dollars are going. That's welfare of the highest order, you know. So these are the things that we traveled and did solidarity trips to expose what U.S. tax dollars are paying for, war, repression, exploitation, and murder, frankly. And that's the reason why I'm here today talking to you. I'll, I'll tell you about the FBI part in a minute. But we've been doing this work for decades with different countries. We sent people to Iraq with the, uh, you know, the Christian pacifist, uh, groups to meet with the Iraqi government and social groups to try to stop the war before it began. We <laughs> sent people to Palestine for decades, to the Philippines. We send people wherever we think we can make a difference so we can bring the stories of people like you and I, teachers, lawyers, peasants, union leaders, students. We want to bring those stories back and organize to get our government to stop funding war and repression. And that's what we're about. So <clears throat> what happened with the FBI is this, is that September 24, 2010, a year and a couple of months ago, they raided two houses in Chicago and five homes in Minneapolis, as well as the anti-war committee office in Minneapolis. Now the thing that we all have in common is we were at the, the core leadership of the people who organized the Republican National Convention protest in St. Paul, Minnesota. Now, we don't like to lead things by ourselves, so I don't want to give you the wrong impression. We had hundreds of friends who helped us out, you know, from many, many cities across the country. But like any leadership, you know, with lots of groups and a big coalition, you still have some people who kind of lift the heavier load, and that's who we were, really. And we made things happen, and we united a lot of people. I want to make a point that at the time of uh, the RNC, the anti-war movement had serious divisions within it, you know? And there were national groups that we were part of and we work, worked with that said that, well, we can't work with them, and they won't work with us. And we listened to this because we all have experienced that too and sometimes been on the wrong side of that dynamic ourselves. So we held a conference in Minneapolis about eight months before the RNC protest and we got all the groups to agree to come together and sit on a stage together and then we let the audience do the uniting. We let the audience ask the questions of the leaders, right? And they demanded unity from them and it worked out great. You know, we got everyone together 
and we proceeded towards the, the protest. So it turned out we were able to get 30,000 people onto the streets of St. Paul, Minnesota, which if you all know is, you know, it's a seven hour drive just from Chicago. So people came a long ways to get there from California and New York and Florida. And we had a great protest where every time one of those candidates, like McCain, appeared on the television, half the screen was shared with our protest for four days, you know? So we think we had a great impact on the election process in that way. And that the anti-war movement, that was like the last big protest we've been able to hold. So when the FBI barged into these houses, they take whatever they want and they, you know, it's, it's like being robbed and violated, you know? Anyone who's been mugged or robbed or had your house burgled, you know what that feeling's like. But this is the government announcing it proudly that they're going to take your stuff. They take your computer, they take your cell phone, they take your notebooks, they take your children's artwork, they take the picture of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King off the wall and put it in a box and put it in their van and take it away. Anything they want, they take. And they have no regard for, for you or your family or your belongings, you know? In one house in Chicago, they took more than 30 boxes out of it. In Minneapolis, they went into Mick Kelly's house, they broke the door in, guns drawn, sniper on the roof across the street, right? You know? Uh, some of the students, they made them sit in their couch, they wouldn't let them go to the bathroom, you know, they're searching through all their things. So that's what the direct experience is like. In Michigan, where I live, I got a call from my friend Stephanie. She said, I'm in the bathroom and there's 20 FBI agents in my house. What do I do? <laughs> and I said, well, you sit tight and, you know, ask to see the warrant. And, you know, I'll try to call people to mobilize them. So within an hour, there were protests at a house in Minnesota and a house in Chicago, right? right out on the front lawns. People were out there right away. People right. said, I'm not going to work, this is more important. Within two hours, we know, over the years, we, we, you know, if you go back to the 80s, we participated in like the Harold Washington campaign for black political empowerment in Chicago to get the first black mayor elected. And we're proud of that work. So we have ties to politicians and their machines, you know, so, one of them lives around the corner from the house that I'm talking about. So he called David Axelrod, who's the advisor to Obama. So we know that they knew right away that people were angry about this, you know? These Democratic Party people don't agree with our views, but they respect what we do in our communities, in our unions, and the struggles we're part of. So we know we had an impact right from the get-go. <coughs> But the most important thing was the outpouring of support that began to flow our way, you know. And if you go to stopfbi.net, you'll see that there are unions representing almost a million They immediately jumped on it and um, you know, the social justice groups movements, but from the church institutions themselves. That's another element. 70 protests in the next two weeks, you know. I don't think I knew anyone in Buffalo before this, you know. And, you know, people are, we were overwhelmed. We thought, you know, we were the ones who were raided and subpoenaed, we, we felt really, you know, you know, under a lot of pressure and isolated. It makes you feel very kind of alone. But immediately all these protests start rolling out across the country and I think it made a really huge impact on things and that solidarity, that's key to what we're trying to, to build. So after Stephanie uh, called me, I said to my wife, they're raiding houses. I tried to call someone in Minnesota and they didn't answer the phone at seven in the morning their time. I said, they're not sleeping, you know. Their house is being raided too. And so um, I turned to my wife and said, well, I, we have a six-year-old. I said, it's important that we get her to school so that if they come here, 
she doesn't have to experience this, you know. Our friends with kids were already experiencing it, you know. And um, so my wife left with our daughter, and my wife went to work after that. So I called someone, and we talked about what to put in a press release. Because our first response is not to recoil, it's to go out and organize. And that's because people have trained us and trained each other over the years that when there's an emergency, stay calm and organize, right? And so that's what we went out to do. And we had a 15-minute discussion about what should go in a press release and what shouldn't go in a press release. And I got in the car with my laptop and I drove out to go find a web cafe. But I'd never been to a web cafe in my town before, and I didn't know where there was one. So I was driving around, and I realized there's someone behind me. Return, I think. So that was the FBI. So I called my wife and went to her work that had a secure garage, and they tailed me right in there with a big black SUV. Uh, they handed us subpoenas. Now the subpoenas, they told us, were to an for an investigation of material support for foreign terrorist organizations, in particular with Palestine and Colombia. Now, I'm a member of the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, and I write for this newspaper, Fight Back, which I would like you all to take with you. And if you go to our websites, you can see exactly what we have to say and what we think and we rarely write things without the purpose of publishing them. If we don't publish them, we probably think they're not very good ourselves and don't think you'll want to read them, you know? You can subscribe to Fight Back Online. Too. That's right. And you can join the Freedom Road Socialist Organization if you send us 20 bucks and we'll give you a subscription. And we're a pretty open group that um, we actually don't do a lot of events and talk about our group a lot. But we are pretty public and transparent in our work, you know. But the FBI must have thought, you know, that we had a lot of information that they wanted to get their hands on. At this point, we estimate they've copied about 10,000 names and addresses and phone numbers and emails from all of our different lists and from our computers and our files. And we know they've digitized 30,000 pieces of data from all our homes before we began to sue them to get our things back, you know. So... What's the status of that, John? The suit? Well, they, as soon as we said we were going to sue them to return the things, that's when they said they digitized it all and then started sending it back. I, I know some people don't have their passports back, you know. Other people got their computers back, but they're kind of goofed up now, to put it politely. So, you know, there's a lot of problems that have resulted. So, it ended up that they're very focused on Colombia and Palestine because of what we write about the revolutionary groups there. And I'm not going to go into detail. I, I'll answer questions if people want, but, you know, there ended up there are 14 people rated originally. Ten of those were trade unionists at some point in their lives or are currently. All of us were involved in the RNC organizing. And some of us were members of Freedom Road Socialist Organization. And some weren't. In December, they subpoenaed nine more people. And to date, none of us, none of us have appeared at the grand jury. We all said we refuse to go testify and give information to the government that they can use against us, against our comrades and friends, against our movement, and most importantly to us, we won't give them information to use against the people we're doing solidarity with. Everyone refused to go? We've all refused to go. 23 of us. None of us have appeared. We can't in good conscience testify against the activists we've met in other countries because the stakes for them are much higher. They're talking about 15-year sentences for us. That's what they're talking about when they talk to our lawyers. They're talking about death sentences if you, if you talk about the trade unionist in Colombia. You know? When I went there in 2003, three trade unionists were being murdered every week. 
Now it's down to a little less than one a week. They still passed the free trade agreement, even though the president talked about it twice in the presidential debates and spoke with me at my union meeting about it for five minutes, you know. But they passed the free trade anyway. What does it matter? It's just, you know, union workers who, in the media in Colombia, they're regularly described as terrorists because they're trade union leaders. Just like if you go to Wisconsin, the Republican Party describes them as outlaws. That's where we're at in this country. We're just that far away from it. So, I, I need to speed up so we can get a discussion going. But the other things, so we had this great movement and response that the brother talked about. 70 cities protested. The, the next nine people who were Palestine activists mostly in December who were subpoenaed. That makes up the 23. They were supposed to appear in January, so we held organized protests on January 26th. Over 70 cities on a single day protested, including five overseas. It was great. And then we exposed the fact that there was a federal agent in our midst at that point. You can go to Stop FBI and read about her. Her name is Karen Sullivan. And they took their time placing her into our activism. She joined the anti-war committee in Minneapolis. We even uh, recruited her to the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. And we became grow growing more and more suspicious of her. You know, some things just didn't seem right, you know? Like what? <laughs> well, um, kind of uh, evasive about her background, for instance. You know, everything in her background was a troubled past. So there was nothing to grasp onto, as one example. You know, everyone has a story, and it's good to find out if it's concrete, you know? How long did you know her? About more than two years. Yeah. And mostly, though, we deal with people's behavior in the movement, right? Whether they're in our group or not in our group, we deal with, are they going to work hard on our campaign? And if you're a member of the groups we belong to, we put you to work. You know, we want hardworking people with us. And so that was the strategy we took as well. Let's, let's see. We'll put the people to work. And, you know, they, uh, you know, we also have sensitive areas of work, I would say, like political prisoner work, where we're careful about who's leading it and who's making the decisions about that work. So... For instance, with Colombian political prisoners, I would not allow her, even someone who's been around five years, I would be reluctant to have be leading work around prisoners, for instance, you know? That's, that's the way I work anyway, because uh, there's a lot of difficulties that can arise in that work, and people need to be somewhat experienced at it. But that's not to discourage anyone. I just think we can be patient about how we develop our our mass groups and our work. So we exposed her, and I invite you to read about her and study about her, but this is what I can tell you. She lied about who she is, she lied about her background, she lied to us about her identity, and she lied to us on a daily basis. And she became close with the women activists in Minneapolis, as close as could be, you know? Yeah. And we don't know that we can believe anything she said. And if there is a trial, she will be the main person that the government uses to try to convict us. And you can count that she's going to lie about a lot of things, you know? That's what you can rely on. Mm -hmm. The other thing that happened, you'll like this, I believe, and you, this will make you go to the website if nothing else does, is that while FBI agents were taking files out of Mickey Kelly's file drawers, they also left their file in his drawer. And it, we found it a few months later. <laughs> and it, the, the Fox News guy I told this to said, they left their whole game plan in his house. I said, exactly. That's what they did. And so you can go online and read about this. It, it has how many weapon clips they should bring for extra you know, backup. It has you know, which agent should knock through the door. It has... 110 questions for members of the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, which read like McCarthyism. It's like going back to the 1950s. Mm. Are you a member of the Freedom Road Socialist Organization? 
How did they indoctrinate you? Who do you pay your dues to? What do they do with your money? You know, it's just 110 questions. And some of it's for individuals. You should read it. I invite you to study it. Because it may be coming to a town near you. So that felt very good to have a little victory on them. Right? It was good to do. But the same week that happened, they raided the home of Carlos Montes, who that's the front page story on the newspaper. Carlos Montes is a veteran Chicano activist in Los Angeles. He's a founder of the Brown Berets. He was a key leader of the East LA walkouts for education reform. Um, there's a Hollywood movie called Walkout about it, where someone portrays Carlos. It's a little strange to know a person and see an actor play them. But um, the, it's, a, it's actually a good movie. But um, Carlos has been very movement with Latinos against war in Los Angeles. And he also is one of the leaders of the immigrant rights movement. When a million people marched in LA in 2006, Carlos was in the front line. If he goes to speak anywhere in the US where there's Chicanos or Latinos, most people know who he is, just so you understand a little bit about him. He also was an SEIU organizer for a few years. And 5 a.m., they come with a battering ram and knock his door through. They come into his bedroom with automatic weapons with the laser lights on him, screaming and shouting. And they arrest him and put him in an L.A. sheriff's car. They also collect every document piece of history from the Chicago <coughs> movement over 40 years that he's collected to write a book and cart that all away. Now what they're charging him with is that he had a weapon and ammunition and that he doesn't, that they're claiming that he's a felon who can't possess those things. Possess. So what they're saying is that 40 years ago, I'm not making this up now, 40 years ago, he threw an empty root beer can and brushed the arm of a police officer at a campus protest uh -huh. at a community college. And that he, he, pled, he pled to that at some point, and they're claiming that it was a felony, but there's no record of it being a felony, and his lawyer is going to contest that the whole way. <coughs> What's interesting is the LA sheriffs who are interviewed by the media twice now have said, oh, this is the FBI's deal. We just did what they told us to do, you know? Now, Carlos is the 24th one of us, and this is why. Carlos was at the RNC with us, and on the last day after we had a protest and 400 people were arrested, and it was us and John McCain on the TV, people were arrested, and we really didn't have leaders to continue the protest. And Carlos got some people together and helped us to retreat from the situation and save a whole lot of people a lot of hassle. We had achieved what we had hoped to achieve already. So he played an important role in that and in building up towards it. When the raids happened in September against us, his name was on the subpoena for the anti-war committee office along with like 20 other people from around the country, people from North Carolina and other states. And then lastly is when he was in the, in the LA Sheriff's car, police car, the FBI approached the car and started asking him questions about the people in the Midwest. And so it's clear to us that this is punishment for being politically, you know, tied to us and organizing with us. And it's serious. It's six charges, felony charges. It can be 18 years total, three years for each one. And we don't think it's going to be a fair trial, you know. The FBI and the prosecutor keep throwing up objections. It's hard to get the information out of them in the pretrial hearings, you know. So the judge is saying that he would like to move things ahead quickly and maybe in January begin. We don't know if it'll begin the trial then, but that's what the judge has said. So this is the main reason I'm here, is to ask you to do solidarity work with Carlos Montes. We think that's the top of the list for us now. The rest of us are still under pressure. 
the, the, the last time our lawyers talked to the, to the U.S. attorney two months ago, they still said multiple indictments are being prepared. That's all I know. They won't tell us if the grand jury's over. They won't tell us if it's been extended. They won't tell us if it's a three-year grand jury, which is a poss possibility. But Carlos Montes is right now, you know. And unless they bring indictments, you know, we want you to protest if they bring indictments within 24 hours, we would like a protest here in your city. But we're asking you to keep in touch with us about Carlos. And when he, the first day of his trial, we'll send people to LA to help organize there. But we want protests in 70 cities again, if we can do it, you know. Maybe we'll get 20, we'll be happy with those 20, you know. But we really want to rally around Carlos. If he gets an 18-year sentence, it's a it's a life sentence, you know. He's a he's a veteran activist, you know. So that's the story. Another point I want to bring up is we just held another conference in Chicago, and we did it a little different than some of the things we've done before. We invited a number of Arab and Muslim women who are wives, daughters one son actually um, and uh, they came and spoke about their loved ones cases and then we also had Carlos speak and we spoke obviously about the raids and everything but we're trying to promote that since 2001 Arabs and Muslims have really been you know treated shabbily would be a nice way to say it you know They've just been targeted and singled out, and the government has these preemptive prosecutions where they're really trying people and putting them in prison and in solitary confinement for thought crimes. Not for things they've done, but for things that they may have been planning to do. And, you know, one guy, I was just talking with Steve Downs in Albany, who works for Project Salam. And he would be good to invite to speak here. He's a fountain of information. He has a wall with 155 names. I, my name's on it. That has all these people who have been imprisoned. And that's only a third of them. You know, it's, it would cover this whole thing here. 155 names. And, you know, one young man we were talking about, uh, Shifa Siddiqui. His family's from Bangladesh. His crime was he translated an ancient Muslim text about jihad. And, and, you know, he talked about it with some other people on the internet. And so they said that he's part of this ring. You know, I'm telling you, it's serious. They, they put him in solitary for like three years, you know. And the, the UN says after one year, it's torture, you know. It might, it might be shorter than that even. But... You know, we're trying to get people to look at these a lot closer and start stepping up to speak out against it. Because if they, you know, we say, well, if they can do it to us, you know, a lot of you think, well, we're, we're a lot like some of those 23, you know. There's some of us you have to identify with. But what we're saying is we're like these Muslim and Arab people who are already in prison and already in the, the system, you know. And we have to speak up for them. And we have to turn some of that around, because it's just wrong. Um, Bradley Manning's case is another thing to link to. Daniel Ellsberg is saying, from the Pentagon Papers days, he's saying that Bradley Manning is directly responsible for the U.S. being forced to pull out of Iraq. The reason that being, mm -hmm. the, the reason being that Bradley Manning's information led the Iraqi government to demand a new agreement with the U.S. forces. And the U.S. government wouldn't agree to that. Daniel Ellsberg said that. Daniel Ellsberg said it about Bradley Manning. Hmm. I heard Daniel Ellsberg speak uh, at, a, at a thing I was at. He also said that uh, what, what Bradley Manning did was a lot less... Um, I don't have the right word, you know. Contentious. Yeah, less contentious, less, you know, the information he gave away was a lot lower level of, of classification. Innocuous. 
That's classified. He even got uh, Peter Hoekstra, the Republican uh, guy, the weapons of mass destruction guy from Michigan, who's really a war criminal himself. He got him to agree with him on that point, you know? So. It's truth it was a lower classification. That's right. That's right. So we're trying to connect with these other cases, you know, and get people to take up some struggle. I would like it if you invited Nora Lashi, who lives in New York City. Her father's one of the Holy Land Five. I think if you bring these people through here, like you've brought me, it will change your whole outlook about what's been happening. You know, I, you know, each time I hear a new case, I, it's like more unbelievable to me that the justice system works the way it does. It's broken. It doesn't work. So, um, you know, we're very, very happy to see Occupy Wall Street and join that movement. In Minneapolis last night, where a lot of the people who were raided, they did 99 tenths for the 99%. And so at 4.30, they, they, the police stormed in and tore out all, all the tents again. But, you know, like other cities, we just keep coming back, you know. In Grand Rapids, I'm, I'm really uh, excited to go down and I talk to people and, you know, I like to hear what is on their minds and then I talk to them about the repression we've been facing. But I, met, I meet former law enforcement officials, is how I'm going to say it, who agree with us, you know, and they're taking part in the protest movement. They're unusual for law enforcement <laughs> professionals, but you know, they're, we'll take them in our movement if they're willing to come with. I think it was uh, the Philadelphia guy, guy unions too. In Philadelphia, there was the police captain who was arrested. Yeah. Oh, I saw that. Oh, right. And uh, Grand Rapids had a strong Tea Party movement in the past. When I come with my newspaper, I've been asked twice, this isn't some Tea Party thing, is it? <laughs> and it's not because they're against, uh, you know, well, they are against the Tea Party, but when I talk to them, I discover they used to be the Tea Party members. Huh. And when the corporations clearly took it over from them, is how they see it, they've, they've turned against it, and now they're part of the Occupy movement. And I'm not saying they're agreeing, you know, I imagine people here have a high level of agreement about what's wrong with society and what we should do to change it. But these people are looking for the ideas that work, you know, and we, we need to step into that and invite them into our movement and build it. And most of the people are like everywhere else, young people, you know, who are, you know, focused on political change and lots of ideas and it's dynamic to go to the general assemblies. And I was glad to see the one in Albany and in Rochester and they seem to be flourishing here in New York and that's good news. So, with all the police repression they faced, it gives us an opportunity to talk to them about the FBI repression and about other movements and the history of those movements and to educate people quickly. It, when, there's a, when there's a movement, it's a lot easier for people to uh, listen to your ideas and start to think differently than they did before, raise their consciousness. So we're asking people to go out to the Occupy movement and educate about Carlos Montes, get our petitions signed, and I'll pass this around in a minute, and you know, do the work to, to you know, put the pieces together for people. Why is the FBI targeting the people who led the big anti-war protests? <coughs> why, is the, why, why is Homeland Security and the FBI coordinating with creating motion towards a national police force that's entirely militarized as well. And, you know, what, what does that mean for the future of our movement? So I have some questions. I don't have all the answers, obviously. But, you know, uh, a brother made a point to me tonight before he had to leave. He said, he said, you know, you should be clear, though, that when the FBI targets a group like yours and, you know, the leadership of movements, it is a little bit different than when the police beat people up at a demonstration. He says there's similarities, sure, but he says we have to be clear that, you know, they're also making decisions about who to attack and how to attack them, all to demobilize movements and take the wind out of our sails, you know? 
So he said, be careful not to just say it's all the same. So I hope I represented what he had to say. Finally, I want to say that I also came here, you know, to try to get you to do things like the supporting support for Carlos Montes. So I'll pass around these petitions. Maybe you guys have, I don't have a clipboard, but maybe you have something a little sturdier we could write on. Yeah, I'll just pass it around here. And I'll also pass around our mailing list that you guys can sign up for. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> So there's two things I wanted to ask you to do besides. On May 15th and May 19th in Chicago, there's going to be the NATO G8 protest. So the bankers and the war makers are getting together for a big meeting. And we need to mobilize tens of thousands of people. We're predicting, again, 30,000. We think we can do it, but we can only do it if you help make it real. You know? And so... I went to Rochester and 15 people promised me two buses. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a good start. I think you have a few more people here. Maybe we could get two, maybe three buses out of you. <laughs> Anyone want to help organize to go to the NATO G8 protest? I got a few. All right. We'll, we'll promise a bus. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so we really need a big mobilization. Um, I drove to Rochester in seven hours. The, the Google says nine. I did it in seven. You know. Yes, brother. What's that? Uh, uh, what's his name? I don't. I don't know what that is. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. But oh, it means list your name on the website. So but it, it's important. So the you know the NATO G8 summit. You know it's. Rahm Emanuel, who's the mayor of Chicago, will be hosting it. And uh, it's going to be a big to-do for the Democratic Party and the U.S. government and Wall Street, right there on the streets of Chicago. We can promise you uh, spring weather. We can promise you a lot of good ethnic food. Chicagoans like to eat. And, uh, you know, we have a good organizing crew in Chicago, the anti-war movement. Maybe you remember we took over Lakeshore Drive back when the Iraq War started. We had 800 people arrested that night when, when we got to the Magnificent Mile. We disrupted traffic for more than five miles, you know? And, you know, I, I was amazed that most of those people stuck in traffic for hours were honking their horns and cheering out the windows because they were against the war from the get-go. You know, I think we had popular support on our side early, you know. So what's the situation in this country? We've got the greatest economic crisis in our lifetime. We've got a war in Afghanistan that's merciless towards the people of Afghanistan. But the U.S. is still losing, you know. You want to talk about popular support. I know the U.S. doesn't have popular support in their occupation there. They're being forced out of Iraq, right? The stuff in Pakistan is very volatile for the U.S. You would not want to have to be an advisor in the Pentagon or White House. You would not want that job right now. That's got to be a tough job because you know you're being pushed back every day. And then at home here, people are fed up. Opinion is against the wars and occupations. The Occupy Wall Street, they've turned what the Tea Party was saying on its head. It's that simple. It's not the government, it's the Wall Street that's the main problem. And Wall Street runs the government. That's why the government's the problem. And it's just so simple. And it drives the Republicans and the Tea Party people crazy. I had the pleasure of being on Glenn Beck's show twice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like it because then people come and talk to me. Oh, I saw you on Glenn Beck. You know, all the leftists watch it secretly. It's like the dirty little leftist secret, you know? <laughs> but Glenn Beck's, Glenn Beck's thing is so crazy that he kind of did us a favor because he posed what our, if they put us on trial, he posed what the trial would be about, you know? And when it sounds crazy from him, it's going to sound crazy from the government, you know? But we, we need to get out there and, you know, let, let the powers that be in Chicago at the NATO G8 know that the people of this country aren't with their agenda for war and poverty. We're going to oppose it. 
And that's going to help people in Tahrir Square in Egypt. It's going to help poor peasants in Colombia. They'll hear about our protests. It might take two months to reach them by word of mouth. But I guarantee you, when I went to, when I went to Columbia, every time I went in the Union Hall and I was introduced as being from Chicago, everyone, all the trade unionists would want to talk to me and not the people from New York or Los Angeles, because they know about the martyrs of Chicago, you know, the Haymarket martyrs. But when we protest here, it has tremendous impact on the movements in the rest of the world. It gives them strength to go out there. You know, they killed 40 people last week in Egypt for protesting. You know, you can bet they're going to repress us in Chicago. They're saying they won't give us a permit. We've applied, you know. But we, we keep going back to demand it. It's our right to protest. It's our right to organize. We have a right to freedom of speech. We're going to use it. So the other thing I want to ask is that there's the Republican National Convention, which is going to happen in Tampa, Florida. We organized to make the you know, march on the Republican National Convention in St. Paul is success. So they raided us and subpoenaed us. So we said, well, once wasn't enough for us. We're going to do it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I want to invite you to, to Florida. Granted, they probably have nicer weather than Chicago. Would you like to pass out? Yes, please. But if you'll consider coming there, having your groups endorse these protests in both cities, you can go online and do it and spread the word, I would appreciate that. So the last thing I want to do before we talk is um, I, I came here and to Rochester and Albany, and I need to ask for funds. The funds pay for three things, for the gas in the car, people let me sleep on their couches, which is awesome, and for food. And lastly, we need money to do our work and to defend Carlos Montes. Every time Carlos goes to court, it costs us, you know, a few thousand dollars. We have to pay the lawyers. We have to. And they don't, they don't charge us, you know, the regular rate. They're being nice about it. But we have to raise, probably, if he goes to trial, a few hundred thousand dollars to do it. And we plan to do that. And I know folks here are of modest means, probably, but whatever you can donate, we appreciate. We, we raised uh, over $100 in Rochester the other night. So I'll give you the hat, sir. And thank you very much for coming to hear me. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions, but I also like opinions and discussion because I